In this episode, we're going to be discussing kind of a Dolly Parton double featurette. Um, and we'll start with the chronologically earlier released one, Steel Magnolias. Released in the late 80s, Steel Magnolias has become known as a chick flick because it dares to tell a story with female protagonists. However, the plot isn't one that dwells on questions of being a woman so much as questions of the human condition. We follow the lives of a group of women over the course of years centered around the major holidays and events, starting with Easter, then Christmas, American Independence Day, or the 4th of July, and so on. The title comes from the concept that although the women are beautiful and delicate looking, they have a strength to bear more than one might expect. Dolly Parton plays the owner of a salon, where she and Daryl Hannah prepare Sally Field and Julia Roberts for the wedding of the latter. There, it's revealed that Roberts' character has juvenile diabetes and is not in the best health. She wants to live a full life, though, and not be held back by her condition, delivering a child over a year later, but in so doing, destroying her kidneys. Sally Field undergoes a kidney transplant, but in the end, it's no good, and the daughter collapses in front of her son. What amazes me is that the child points right to his dying mother, and the father actually asks a few times where she is. She dies later in hospital. This all comes to a head at the daughter's funeral where Sally Field doesn't know what to think. Daryl Hannah plays a bit of a simpleton, but she sums up things nicely. That the daughter was trying to take care of everyone, and her body just couldn't take it, and that now she can take care of everyone without worrying about her body giving out. It's touching, heartfelt, but it doesn't address what Sally Field's character has to cope with. She says that she was there when the life of her daughter began, and when at the hospital was there when her life ended. It isn't fair, and it isn't right, but the others tell her that the best thing to do now is to make sure that the grandson never forgets his mother and the love that she had for him. Another year passes, and we're back at Easter time, as Daryl Hannah's character is very pregnant. She asks to name the child after the late daughter, and we see that life goes on for the people much as before. Steel Magnolias gets a 4 out of 5. It's dated, but well-made drama, with compelling characters and actors. The male characters are rather two-dimensional, but the motivations of the female characters go beyond their relationships with men, and into their relationships with one another. Therefore, it passes the uh, Mako Mori test and the Bechdel test. Pardon the pronunciation if it's off. Uh, the stories are interesting and resolve in such a way as to satisfy. Straight Talk. Released in 1992, Straight Talk is Dolly Parton's last starring role in a major Hollywood release. She wouldn't receive top billing in a film again until 2012 when she co-starred in Joyful Noise opposite Queen Latifah. Straight Talk is the story of Shirley Kenyon, a woman who lives in a small Arcon Arkansas town where no matter what job she takes, she can't help engaging and listening to them and trying to help them with their problems. Her boyfriend is neglectful and a drunkard. So after being fired from another job for being a considerate human being, she packs up what little money she has and takes it to Chicago. When she's counting it on a bridge, and most of it blows away, she goes over the rail to grab the last of it, and James Wood's character Jack is looking down from his office as a newspaper reporter, thinking that Shirley is about to jump. He runs down to stop her, and she chews him out for stopping her, and she goes to get breakfast at a diner where she unknowingly meets Jack's girlfriend, played by Terry Hatcher. Hatcher is best known for playing Lois Lane in Lois and Clark, the romantic sitcom based on Superman comics. You don't ever see her again in the film, so let's just call her Terry Hatcher's character Jack's girlfriend. At this second encounter, Jack tells Shirley about a hotel that doesn't charge much for rent and security deposits and is a good place to get started. She finds that the place is cheap because the fully furnished rooms are dated but spacious, clean, and, com and comfortable. 
It doesn't bother her because it's exactly what she's used to back in Arkansas. Shirley goes in to apply for a position as a receptionist at a radio station and is mistaken for a female doctor who is the new host of a call-in help show. When they find how good she is, they work with her, even though she's honest about who she really is. They encourage her to play the part by letting her know that she's helping others and offering her more money than she's dreamed of. The basic plot of The Liar Revealed is set up here, and we follow it to its full fruition when one of the family of a caller confronts her publicly to let her know that the advice she gave was to one side of the story and left the family devastated. In the lead-up to a very G-rated sex scene, they let nothing describe the sex between Shirley and Jack. Not visual, not audio, anything. They go into the bedroom, and he simply exclaims, Wow! To which she replies, Well, what were you expecting? This is a reference to Parton's notoriously large and often fetishized breasts. Honestly, I was so involved with the characters that I had forgotten about Dolly's breasts, so that tells you how compelling the dialogue and storytelling really are. Now, I should mention that there is a Liar Revealed story arc for Jack as well, involving Shirley, and this illustrates the second point of the title. Shirley isn't honest with the public, even though her advice is, but Jack isn't honest with, Sh with Shirley. If they talked straight to one another, then they wouldn't have the upset that they do later. Another thing to point out is that Dolly Parton wrote and performed a lot of the music for this film. And some of the scenes are montages or otherwise sans dialogue so that the music can tell the story, much serving the purpose of the Greek chorus from Hellenic theater. This film is definitely a pre-9-11 style of film and comedy. Eventually, I'll come to a list of differences between films from before and after 9-11, but the transition was already on its way before the event. It's part of what I would call the transition from a Western centrist movement to that of a kind of American Biedermeyer period. This film represents a point in time when we were transitioning from the Reagan and Bush years to the Clinton years, which were much more centrist. And you can see that in the story and how it's told. As a comedy, it worked well, and I had a lot of laughs watching this film from beginning to end. I'll give Straight Talk a 5 out of 5 for its delightful entertainment, the fact that over 20 years later, after its release, you can watch it and still find it entertaining, and the fact that the story, characters, and music all lend themselves to an enjoyable piece with a good message.